Hey, good evening, everybody. Let me turn down my music. <laughs> it is 6 o'clock in the West Coast. It is 9 o'clock in the East Coast. And for the rest of the United States, it is somewhere in between. I want to say good evening and happy Monday to everyone. I hope you had a great weekend. Thank you all for joining. I see that Jennifer's here. Uh, I see Mance is on board. Janelle, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for everybody for uh, joining me this evening. I'm coming on a little early because um, my best friend Roger is here and he needs an emergency haircut. So we just finished up two days of training and I uh, promised Jennifer that I would log on tonight and address some subject matter. So hey, Veronica, how are you? Welcome. Welcome to everybody. And so uh, we just finished up two days of our performance engagement training. It's been a wonderful training. We've had a great time, um, very exciting, lots of fun things going on. And our final phase will be December 11th and 12th. It'll be our final session with our group, and uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, it's interesting in this industry that uh, we have so many people that do education and uh, really sometimes don't feel that they need to uh, to learn a little bit about facilitation um, and it, the difference between working behind the chair and training people is huge huge difference so uh, if you're interested in improving your skills and raising your bar um, i invite you to take a look at our pet training uh, it is a six-day program that spans probably three to four months we we try to separate it out in time and it's all about facilitation it's the way that you deliver information, the way that information transfers. Um, not going to make you a better colorist. It's not going to make you a better hair designer, but it certainly will make you a better facilitator. That I promise you. So anyway, I want to get down to business this evening. Uh, Jennifer uh, contacted me and other people contacted me and said, would you talk a little bit, when does the next PET start? Great question. And uh, that'll be posted within the next two days. So we'll, we'll get you all set up ASAP. Uh, she said, could you address the red dye molecule story? And of course, you know, look at me. I've been in this business for a while, and so that story has kind of lingered, been in and been out in our industry. So tonight I want to kind of address it. It seems to me that uh, there's still an interesting thing about belief systems. Sometimes belief systems are um, very, very strong. And sometimes you can't change belief systems. Even though you give them the science and you give them the information, uh, they really sometimes don't want to believe it. You know, I was listening to the radio the other day and they had a doctor on talking about sugar. And he said, do you realize there's 52 different names for sugar? So you don't have to call it sugar, but there's 52 different names you can use. And the moderator of the program said, well, you need to educate people about that. And he said, well, you know, we've been trying to educate people for years, but sometimes when it's a habit that you have or when it's a belief system that you have, it's very, very hard because you have to be ready to maybe look at things a different way. So I kind of want to address some of the stories about the red dye molecule. Here's a story as has happened in our industry. The story is the red dye molecule is a huge molecule. It's much larger than the blue or yellow dye molecule. And um, therefore, it uh, has a tendency to fade out of the hair quicker. Uh, and yet, the contradicting story is you can't lighten the red dye molecule out of the hair because if you do that uh, and you try to do it with bleach, it will drive the dye molecule in further. So here's what I think happens. We get a little bit of science. We get a little bit of our personal spin on the story, a personal interpretation, and they get all mixed together. And that's how we create urban legends. So let's talk about red dye molecules. First of all, uh, there are no such things as basketballs, baseballs, and golf balls in hair color. Now, I know many of you may have been to educational classes where they said the blue dye molecule is really tiny, the red dye molecule is really large. That is not the way intermediary dyes are made. They're all basically the same, same size, same shape. So <laughs> when you create a red dye molecule, you're not putting red in the hair specifically. You're putting intermediary dyes that are identified as, um, they're identified alpha and they're identified numeric. So you may put an A1 dye or a B3 dye in combination and that creates a red shade in the hair. Now, the reason that I think the red dye molecule being really fat really started in our industry was many years ago, back before many of you were in the business, 
there was an issue where the government had banned an intermediary dye called red dye number three. And the reason for that was because they had found a correlation between that red dye and cancer. Not a causation, but a correlation, meaning that people that they interviewed uh, had cancer and they also had a tendency to color their hair. So the government banned red dye number three. So all manufacturers were then confined to red dye intermediaries that didn't create true reds, they created red orange. And so in order to give you a more true red, a manufacturer would also put into their, into their color direct dyes. They would load them up with direct dyes that would pull the color more to a rich red shade and it would give you the result you're looking for. That's where the word dye load came from. You know, if, you, if you're wondering, where did that term come from? It came from loading up permanent hair color with direct dyes. And that color system was identified or called the binary color system, meaning that the small oxidation dyes would bond together inside the hair strand. They would form a netting, if you will, around the large red dye molecules and hold them in the hair. The problem was that eventually those red shades would fade. And when those red shades faded, they faded to the actual red orange, which was the color of the intermediary dyes that you were putting in the hair. So that's where that whole thing about large red dye molecule came from, I think. But it's funny to me that in 2016 today, that story still exists because today most manufacturers use oxidative dyes, 100% oxidative dyes. And so those are smaller dyes, uh, smaller intermediaries, they're carried deeper into the hair strand and they're longer lasting. There are many of you in this industry that are using red color in your brand and you love the red color and it does not fade like they used to. And the reason it doesn't fade is because of the dye intermediary, intermediaries that they're using and the reduction in, in ammonia in the hair color. So we have lower ammonia, we still have alkalinity, we have lower ammonia, we have smaller dye molecules or dye intermediaries which are causing those reds to have more longevity, to stay brighter and last longer. So. Here's the thing that I would urge you to consider, is that sometimes we get caught up in these stories that are not wrong, they're just skewed. Here's why I think they said, well, you can't lighten the red out of the hair, you have to neutralize it first, because if you try to lighten it out, you'll drive it further in the hair strand. And I think that doesn't have anything to do with permitted hair color, I think that has to do with natural red hair. As you all know, clients or, or people who have a higher ratio of fail melanin in their hair, which is the red-orange melanin, and a lower proportion of eumelanin, which is the brown-violet pigment in their hair, those people who have higher ratios of fail melanin in their hair, it's very hard to get them light. Now, natural redheads, in many cases, have a lot of fail melanin in their body. They have a lot of pigmentation. So to get them to a blonde sometimes can be very challenging. And even if you can get them to a blonde, you'll notice that in about two weeks after you've done that, if they have a high amount of fail melanin in their hair, the hair starts to get brassy again. And you go, how is that possible? Here's how that's possible. Remember this, fail melanin, even when you lighten the hair, fail melanin will have a tendency to actually reform or reconnect inside the hair strand and that brassy tone will come back. So I'm sorry, but not everybody can be a blonde. <laughs> and definitely not everybody can be a platinum blonde. So uh, when we talk about you know, color, we sometimes get mixed up with what natural pigment causes and what artificial pigment causes. Now, as far as driving the dye molecules further in the hair, um, I'm a visual person, I'm sure you are too, so I'm going to flip the camera around. I kept my slides up because I want to show you um, what happens when we color hair. So let me tap twice. And uh, what you're looking at right there on the screen right now is temporary hair color. And as you can see, those are large dye molecules that attach themselves to the outer layers of the cuticle layer. And they embed themselves somewhere inside 
in the furthest or in the outermost layers. Remember, direct dyes do not go deep into the cuticle layer. They're just on the outermost layers. Most hair strands have anywhere from seven to ten layers of cuticle. And so they're in that like first three to four layers of cuticle. So when I try to lighten a direct dye out of the hair, what happens is, remember, they not only embed themselves, but they also stain the cuticle. And the cuticle is translucent. It's sort of like if you were to go to the supermarket and go to the butcher shop section, and you would look through those plastics where you can kind of see through them, but you can't see through them. That's kind of what the cuticle layer looks like. So those are embedded in the cuticle. When we try to lighten those direct dyes out of the hair, we do lighten them out of the hair fiber. But remember, they're staining the cuticle as well. And so sometimes you'll still have a shadow left in that hair after you've tried to lighten it. That is not driving the dye in further because it's impossible to do that. Those dye molecules are very, very large. But what it is is that's that shadow of that staining that's still in the hair. So let's take a look at a demi-permanent hair color. Now, you can see there's a small gray molecules, and then you see the red molecules. The small gray molecules are what we call the oxidative dyes. They're colorless until they bind together and create a visual result. The large ones are staining molecules. So in many demi-permanent colors, we have a combination of direct dyes and of indirect dyes. And so that's how demi-permanent colors work. Demi-permanent colors work in and around the cuticle, deeper in the cuticle layer, because they do have oxidative dyes in them as well. But that is how they work, okay? Demi-permanent hair colors. Now let's take a look at permanent hair color. Permanent hair color, as you can see, those are total oxidation dyes. They penetrate deep into the cortex. That's where color is formed in the cortex, and it's also formed in the innermost layers of the cuticle. So when we color a hair strand, we're not just coloring hair in the cortex, we are also coloring hair in the cuticle layer as well. So that's important to remember, because here's what happens. Another urban legend. People use a clarifying shampoo on someone that they freshly colored, and the hair is lighter after the shampoo. And they say, oh my God, clarifying shampoo lighten the hair. That's not true. Here's what happened. Remember, clarifying shampoos have chelating agents in them, and those chelating agents are designed to harness materials that are loose, residuals that are loose in and around the cuticle, and remove them from the hair. So what you're actually removing is the residual dyes that haven't successfully bonded together. That's right, EDTA is the, is the ingredient that is causing that to happen. So I just want you to be aware of what the, what the colors do to the hair. It is a chelator, EDTA is a chelator. Now I want you to take a look at these hair strands. Up there on the left hand side, that's what a healthy hair looks like. Now you notice that it is not smooth. That uh, you can see the cuticle imbrications. And remember, the cuticle layer is semi-permeable. That means it has small microscopic holes in it. But they're not big enough to drive a direct dye through. That picture in the very center, that is what it looks like when we rip off the cuticle layer of the hair strand. What you now see is an exposed cortex. I'm sorry, there is no way that that hair will hold color. No matter what you use, it's not gonna hold color for a long time because you have no cuticle layer left in the hair. In the upper right hand corner, you can see that's a swollen cuticle, very damaged. You can see the other two pictures as well. And that one at the very bottom right, that is what split ends look like under a scanning electron microscope. So it gives you an idea of what we're working on. This is why many products that we use are harsh and caustic but yet we feel the hair and the hair feels really good. And the reason for that is because we don't have a scope where we can see what's happening to that hair. So we're going simply by our visual, by our naked eye and the feel in our hands. So if I'm a product manufacturer and I put enough emollients or conditioning agents in that caustic product, I can mask what that product is really doing to the hair.
Here's one more slide I want to share with you before I go tonight. The upper left hand corner is what a healthy hair strand looks like. You can see that. I want you to look at the one directly below that. Those are called cortical fibers. You know how you go to the class in science and they, they draw up that ladder with the salt bonds and the hydrogen bonds and the disulfide bonds and we all look at the inside of the hair like a ladder? That's not what it looks like at all. It actually looks like telephone cables that are all wrapped together. So when you think about disulfide bonds, they're all intermixed in that area. And salt bonds are all intermixed. And so are hydrogen bonds. They are all mixed together. So when we damage the cortex of the hair, we are damaging the structure of the hair. Now, upper right-hand corner, that is what it looks like when you lose cuticle. You can see that uh, under the scanning electron microscope, that the cuticle has holes in it. That's what peroxide does to the cuticle. High volumes of peroxide will actually drive holes into the cuticle layer. That's why people think they get better penetration by high volumes of developer. They do because they're punching holes in the cuticle, but it's not long lasting. You can see where all that cuticle has slipped. And so that means that we're probably gonna have what are called, now I'm gonna just say this, I'm not gonna spell it for you, inner micellary vacuoles. Let me say that one more time. Inner micellary vacuoles are holes that are in the cuticle layer. That is why it's important. You can do a lot of good with protein, but can replace lost, can't replace lost cuticle. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, and so that is why it's important to incorporate treatments into everything we do when we color hair. Okay, so, and hopefully I've given you some visuals to uh, hopefully make this uh, information more powerful for you. Um, if you like what you've heard today, thank you for letting the hearts roll. Share the information with your friends. Uh, remember, uh, our company is called Guru Villages. We are an empowerment company for salon professional. Our vision is to help you become more successful by sharing with you honest, truthful, scientific information that will help you make the right choices and decisions to be successful in your career. Listen, I thank you all for listening. I'll catch any questions that are on here. You're welcome. And uh, I'll see you all tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, on the day after broadcast. So, until now, um, from, until then, from my heart to yours, Captain Color out.